What's going on, everybody? Welcome to Decred in Depth. I'm your host, Angelo, and today we have Checkmate on the show. How you doing, brother? Thanks, mate. Good to be here. Excellent. So let's uh, go over the basics over here. What's your background and your genesis into the cryptocurrency space? Yeah, I mean, my background's a little bit different to a lot of people in this industry. It's uh, I'm actually a civil engineer by trade. So looking at charts and looking for uh, for various fractals and patterns is, is kind of where my, my, my skills lie. Uh, I entered crypto in peak of 2018, so right right in January, which you know I would say for me is probably the best time for me to have entered because until this point, I've pretty much only seen a bear market and it's been a, uh, a huge learning curve. And uh, yeah, I, I think it's a, it's a true test of your own willpower to, to enter a market at the peak, um, learn about it all the way down. And I, I think that the way that the narratives have changed in this industry has been a huge a huge education curve for me. So, you know, that was that was basically my entry. And uh, I think there's a huge credit to to the guys at Ready Set Crypto that I work with who uh, I actually started off as a subscriber there. And uh, um, they basically distilled so much good information on the fundamental side and then Doc on the trading side. And whilst I entered the cryptocurrency space for the initial technology and all the the hype that was going on, it really was understanding the macro trends, understanding what the charts were telling you, and having that distillation of information uh, r- really took me a long way. It helped me focus my mind so I could think about what else was going on in this industry. And the more you boil it down, I think the closer and closer you come down to understanding that it's all about sound money. So I've gone through the uh, the washing machine of being a, a full multi-coiner, um, come out the other side being... I wouldn't say a Bitcoin maximalist, but certainly a, a Bitcoin rationalist where you start to understand a bit more that, that money and, and uncensorable transparency is what this is all about. And there's there's lots of things you could do with a blockchain, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's the right thing for you to do. So that was uh, that was really my entry into the, uh, into the industry. Yeah, I can relate. I have a very similar story. Um, I definitely got punched in the face by the... By the bear market, most. But what a learning experience, right? Oh yeah, I, I wouldn't trade it for anything. It no, was, it, it, was, it, it's it money great. well spent. Absolutely. So, how did you come across Decred? Yeah, so I mean, I, I think over the last probably twelve to twelve to eight um, eight months or so, uh, I've basically been on a podcast binge where I think I've I've got through pretty much everything that's out there on the air. And the more I listen to these things, and the more I try to expand and then contract and understand exactly what's going on. Um, the closer I did come to that sound money perspective. And to be honest, I, w- I was almost at the point of writing off uh, altcoins in general, uh, just thinking that I-, I couldn't quite see a world where there would be a-, a-, a need for much more than you know a Pareto-style distribution of these coins. And um, I really was starting to settle on Bitcoin. And I think I came across uh, hearing JYP talking on a, it might have even been the Hacker Noon podcast. And I had heard about Decred before, and until that point, I'd, I'd kind of thought of it as a governance token and kind of related to things like Aragon and, and, and the various DAOs on Ethereum. But uh, when I when I understood the incentives and the way that risk is allocated in the Decred network, that really got me thinking because I, I, I'd boiled it down in my understanding of Bitcoin to it's all about incentives and how you pull the most support. So really, really, crypto networks need people under them. It's, it's just people on the other side of these transactions that keep them alive. And when you start to understand that it's all about the incentives and how you actually allocate risk between the network, that's really what got me engaged. And, and Decred, I think, just comes at that, that angle from a, a truly unique perspective. And, and really, that's what, that's what got me right into it. So now, what are the primary differences you see between uh, Bitcoin and Decred? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, I think... At their core, they're fundamentally coming from the same Austrian sound money perspective. But where I see the big difference is in who these networks employ and how they allocate risk and and ownership of that risk and responsibility. Um, If you look at the way that Bitcoin does things, and and really I I look at these as these crypto networks as digital organisms, I, I think that's probably the best analogy I've come across. And I think uh, I think Brandon Quinnum did an excellent job in his his discussion about Bitcoin as a fungus, how it's, you know, it's, uh, it, it's super agile. Um, you can take part of it out and it, it continues to tick along. Uh, I think that's a, a really fascinating and, and very relevant analogy. 
So I, I do look at these things as a form of digital organism. And, you know, even, even Ralph Merkel talks about how uh, people keep Bitcoin alive because it performs a valuable service. And, I mean, re really with Bitcoin, people work for it. The miners work for it uh, because of the scarcity element. It does have that core scarcity um, that, that, that pulls people in. It's what draws users in, which then gives the network enough transactions and enough value for, uh, for the miners to keep working for it. And in response, people pay for that service. And I think where Bitcoin and Decred really differ here is that people work for Bitcoin and it's very much based on independent greed. It's based on individuals acting in their own self-interest. And where I see Decred actually playing a different, a different role is it incentivizes a little bit differently. It incentivizes the miners to provide that level of security and much the same, it's driven by that scarcity element and you know that forward planning of, of, of income. It also incentivizes the stakeholders, so people who can actually be allocated that risk to make the decisions. And I think that's, I mean, that really is that proof of stake element and the way that Decred, specifically the way that Decred has hybridized them is really, uh, really important here. And the other one is it incentivizes builders. And when you look at that, that trio of people who are working, not necessarily for the protocol, but with the protocol, and that, that's, that's one of those elements I see as being a, a significant distinction with Bitcoin, people work for Bitcoin somewhat subserviently to it, and that is in, indeed one of its one of its features and its strengths. But with Decred, it, it trades off some of that independent greed element, and it trades it off for somewhat of a collective intelligence. And arguably, if if you don't instill some kind of human element into these crypto networks, the reality is that you're just not going to be able to compete with Bitcoin because it really is that hardcore organism. That really doesn't need people to do anything in terms of decisions because they their own independent greed will get them there in the first place. So in order to compete with with Bitcoin, I see that the decred organism is basically instilling a hive mind of people to to make those intelligent decisions and 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 bring about that you know that human organization side of things. So yeah, I think they're they're, they're similar in their sand money principles but they differ in terms of who they employ and who actually owns the risk of the decisions in the network. Now, how do you see these two protocols coexisting together? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, there's a few angles that I kind of come at this from when I'm, I'm, I'm starting to build my mental model around both of these coins. Um, I think fundamentally it's about he hedging risk and how risk is allocated both you know, from, from external parties, but basically anybody who touches this network, how is that fundamental risk allocated? And Really, Bitcoin approaches it with a very rigid and conservative path. Uh, and I see Decred as kind of like the creative younger brother. It takes on that role of adaptation and, and governance. Um, to, to, and, you know, the use cases are going to evolve over time. We have no idea what this, this space, this technology or anything else is going to look like in, uh, in, in 10, 30, 50, 100 years. And really, these are 100-year-long projects or more. We're building something that in theory, you know, gold's, gold's been around since... Uh, since the early days, you know, it's thousands of years of history. And if we're going to be pushing a digital future and digital money, I think there's room in, in the world for more than one implementation of that. I think there's a risk that too much money can get tied up in Bitcoin. And I think at some point there's going to have to be a hard fork. I think that's, that's one of those inevitable things because the future is uncertain and there's going to be elements of Bitcoin that do need to be replaced. Um, and I think that when that time comes, and even before that, the world is not going to be allocating all of their eggs to a single basket. I really do think that there's room for more than one of these critical, store, critical mass store of value type projects because money needs to move between these two and, and basically almost as a hedge between each other. And I think Decred, it comes at the whole sound money principle from, uh, as far as I'm aware, the most different approach to, to any of the other altcoins that are out there. It's done a lot more than the Litecoins and the, the Bcashes of the world. It's come at it with a whole different, different perspective. And I think the way that it's instilled that governance uh, and, and, and the allocation of risk and the ability to adapt, it kind of plugs all the holes and the major critiques in Bitcoin. And just the same, Bitcoin is this hardcore animal that just goes in its, its own direction and its, its strength is its, it, it, it's rock solid and it doesn't change. And I think in a world, I mean, if you imagine those two side by side, 
they do in fact play off each other. And between the two of them, you have a very, very sound, sound money platform and you cover all of the bases. So I think that that future proofing and, and, and providing the world with a financial hedge between those two networks is, uh, is going to be immensely powerful. And I think finally, it's, it's specialized as a, a, a decentralized uh, point of human organization. And I think that's, you know, that's, that, that's a really interesting uh, facet of the Decred design. So now I read your work on Medium, um, some of the articles that you've recently published. Do you mind covering the stock to flow ratio for those that may not understand what that is? Yeah, sure. So stock to flow is a concept that I believe is borrowed from the commodities markets. But what it's effectively looking at is uh, gold is probably the best example to start with. Um, all the gold that's been mined over history is effectively uh, still in existence. Uh, it, it, it's atomically stable and uh, very, very little of it relative to how much we mine goes into industrial applications and the like. So the actual amount of gold that we have above the ground uh, it has more or less just increased in time. And we consider that to be our stock. If you then look at something like gold mines, they're producing an annual output or there's a, a degree of inflation that comes in. And that was what we consider the flow. And when you look at the ratio of those two, uh, if, if you do uh, your flow divided by your, your stock, that'll give you your inflation rate. If you take the inverse of that, you end up with your stock to flow ratio. And it effectively says if you've got a stock to flow ratio of, of 100, it means if you mine at the current rate, for 100 years, you will end up with the stock that you currently have above ground. So it's kind of a projection of that. Now, when you have a very scarce item like gold or um, uh, or various other commodities, they're, they're hard to come by. So the, the higher that stock to flow ratio actually is, the more scarce the asset is because it takes a lot longer to produce the same amount as we currently have above ground. So how is the stock to flow ratio applicable in crypto assets, say like a, like Bitcoin? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the fundamental difference with the stock to flow ratio with crypto assets and specifically fixed, uh, fixed supply crypto assets is we, can, we have a deterministic supply schedule. So we can estimate now and ahead of time how much supply and what the inflation rate is going to be at any particular point in time. And there's never really been in history a time when we've been able to do that with such an important asset as, as money. The ability to actually map out exactly and forecast what the income, uh, what the stock, what the flow, and uh, effectively what the dilution rate is going to be for anybody who's holding onto that, that particular asset. We've never been able to see that before. So uh, what, what, what is important with Bitcoin, for example, is the halving events, which is effectively a, a significant shock to the supply side. And when you couple that with the difficulty adjustment that actually, no matter how much mining power you throw at it, you won't be able to pr produce more than what is deterministically already defined in the code. You end up with a pure supply shock. And effectively, if demand remains the same, price is the only thing that can really move. So with, with Decred, you have much the same, where we don't have the same halvings uh, in play here. But what we do have is a ticket lockup with the um, with proof of stake, so that effectively takes coins out of that degree of circulation, and you end up at a scenario where, over time, an increasing number of those coins become effectively outside circulation, and your your stock uh, and your inflation rates start to actually change. So that that'll certainly be part of my uh, my ongoing research to understand exactly how those two uh, interact with each other. Now, you mentioned the Pareto distribution before. you mind explaining that and how is it applicable to the top crypto assets? Yeah, and I mean, I, I guess I bring this back to what I was saying before, that I, I think there's a, lot of, there's a lot of variables in the future. No one really knows what it's all going to look like. I think it's, it's not, at least in the medium term, I think it's more likely that there will be a number of these crypto assets, especially as we're exploring all the ideas about what is possible. Uh, but in the long term, I think what's really going to drive the, a, a Pareto-style distribution or a, you know, a, a long tail of assets that have very low utilization and a select number of them that have a very, very high utilization is the fact that blockchains are slow databases and they're really not suited to the majority of use cases. So I, I think really that they boil down to if somebody wants to shut it down, 
then that is the perfect opportunity for a blockchain. If nobody's looking to shut it down, then it, it's a very, very expensive way. Decentralization is inherently expensive and it's it's probably not the right choice. And, and, and centralized systems work best for the majority of use cases. And this is really where, uh, in terms of my mental model, when I look at what blockchains are used for, I think it's money, I think is the number one uh, use case and, and that separation of money and state. And I think human organization is another key area and the ability to actually work and, and organize people in a distributed fashion. And w within crypto networks, you have this incentive structure that's arguably very different to anything we've seen before. So, uh, and, and I think the final, the final piece that, that goes into it is, is finality. Blockchains are designed for finality. And when you package those three things together, You've got a security budget that is expensive in order to actually keep these things final. There's a degree of network effects, which you know we can see in the market today that Bitcoin has, you know, uh, a significant share of. And when you think about the different use cases, you don't want to be using the money necessarily or the the platform necessarily that nobody else is on. If your business partners are using a particular system, um, and arguably with money, we should be removing a lot of the friction of exchange rates and, and national borders here. Uh, it, once you start to move into this digital global world, network effects and having your peers all on the same network start to play a big, uh, a very large role in, in keeping these things alive. So um, I, I, can, I can't see a great number of these networks existing because there's going to be too many users that start to, to collectively move towards the most saleable good when it comes to, to money and uh, for any of this other technology, it's it, it's going to it's going to iron down to a handful of these projects rather than have a a significant multi coin verse in uh, in my opinion. So now with some of the research that you've done with DCR, I saw you write about your Decred value stack. You mind um, explaining that and sharing some of the things you've learned? Yeah. So I guess my value stacks where I've tried to boil this thing down. Uh, in, how you actually assess from a fundamental analysis perspective these crypto networks. And I, I think the, the starting point is you look at what Bitcoin has done and then you try to expand that to understand how different projects can kind of fit into that. So the way I've, I've broken down Decred in my own mind is fundamentally it's adopted the same scarcity and deterministic supply schedule as Bitcoin. Uh, it's, it's, a proven, it's a proven system. The stock to flow ratio works. And it's, it's clearly been dri driving a lot of that value. There's some great work that Plan B, uh, goes by the handle at 100 trillion USD, has done looking at how we can actually establish some kind of, I mean, you can look at it as a visual sense, but applying some mathematical and statistical rigor to understanding exactly how that stock to flow ratio applies to scarcity and, and deterministic schedule. So uh, with, with gold, we have that example over thousands of years, civilizations move towards a single sound money and Bitcoin has clearly taken the market and, uh, and arguably the world by storm here. So that, that fundamental scarcity element is still retained by Decred. It still holds on to that, that core principle of fixed supply and deterministic schedule. Um, I then step it up and I look at, okay, well, what actually drives the scarcity of these networks? And uh, again, I, I pull back to this concept of unforgeable costliness, which I think is a, a really nice way to frame it and, and get your head around it. It's that um, whatever it takes to produce the particular asset, in gold's case, it's, it, it's establishing, operating and running gold mines. Um, with Bitcoin, it's the proof of work uh, and the, the, the immaculate conception. And I, I think when you, when you look at proof of work as a, as a consensus mechanism itself, it's that capex and opex that the miners have to commit to the system. And you, you just cannot acquire Bitcoin without applying your share of the of the hash rate so that's and you, you the only other way you do is is to effectively buy the asset and over time it's unlikely that on average people are going to be selling it for a lot less than what they spent to actually earn it at a discount there's going to be periods of time with that when you get drawdowns and all the rest of it but fundamentally i think that it's 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 the intrinsic cost that it takes to produce it um, as well as that deterministic schedule that that assigns an asset with, with true scarcity here. And with Decred, you've also got that proof of work element with the 60% uh, of the block reward. But then you've also got this element of the proof of stake um, 
system. So really, there's th- there's three ways you can earn decred. One is to mine it. One is to um, stake it, and the other one is to work for your, work for the system and earn it out of the treasury. And I think when you when you factor that in, you've got you, in terms of an unforgeable costliness for this asset, you've got the proof of work. In terms of the proof of stake, in, you effectively need to capture a significant portion of the market cap. And because there's that pseudo random selection process as to when your tickets actually get called and, uh, and, and vote on the previous proof of work block, you're committing a significant portion of upfront capital and you, you're committing it for a, you know, indeterminate period of time. Yeah. So you've got the lockup and your, when it, whatever decision and event occurs at that period of time, you have to bear that risk exposure because there's a period of time until the rest of your capital comes out. So if you if you if you wrap that all up, you've got the unforgeable costliness of the proof of work element. You've also got arguably the capture of the community and uh, community consensus, uh, as well as your capital to get into the proof of stake pool. So uh, really, and the only other way to earn it is to work for Decred. In which case, you end up getting pulled into this vortex of doing good work, uh, creating value for the system, and. This is where I see Ducred playing a very important role in capturing and retaining human mind share. It really does pull people in to either work for it, to understand what the incentives and the consensus mechanism really looks like. And I think once you get pulled into that understanding and that level of detail and what Decred is doing, um, it's it's very, very hard to uh, to look back and, and, and get out of that. So I think what that effectively forms is a, a fundamental social contract, which is very, very strong. It's the underlying security from both the proof of stake and the proof of work. And what this boils down to is a very, very strong governance system. That's kind of the next layer in this value stack. And what I really like about the Decred governance system is that it keeps the community intact. The fork resistance and the ability to actually bring people along, A, for the ride, but B, keep those people who enter that vortex and their mind share gets captured into the, into the system people actually have a say and they can help drive the direction of this project. And I think that's that's really underappreciated because, it, you know, if you look at Bitcoin, it's gone down the path of it will continue to exist and it's kind of up to you whether you choose to, uh, to participate or not. With Decred, you have a choice to participate and your participation actually has, a, has meaning to it. And I think it instills, you know, we, we talk about sound money, but I really like the concept of, sound ownership and accountability and responsibility. And I think those three things we've, we've really lost somewhere in the, in, in the world at the moment. There's, there's so much that you see where accountability is just, it, it, it's a missing thing. And I think to reintroduce uh, accountability and responsibility for people's decisions and actions is, it, I, I think it's going to become increasingly important in a, in, in a very, very uncertain world. So um, I think that that ability for Decred to to bring people in and then retain them at an individual level and keep those people engaged, yeah, I, I think that's that's invaluable. And there's very few very few projects or protocols. When I mean, we're talking about protocols here, that are able to actually enact that kind of change on on people at a fundamental level. And then I think the final layer of of, of my value stack is all of this boils down to um, increased people coming into the system. Um, the ability to keep those people on board and uh, and actually use their collective mind power and intelligence for good. And over time, I do expect that to grow the the amount of assets under management in the Decred treasury. And what that then opens up is the ability for Decred to employ any number of people. Um, it becomes a self-reinforcing proposition where the scarcity drives the, uh, the security, the social contract drives good governance, and then the treasury drives adaptability and self-sustaining um, longevity. So I think when you combine those three things, you have a project and a, a sound money protocol that's it really is here for the 100-year race. And I think what it does differently to almost everything else is at a protocol level, it brings people in and it looks after them. And that's why I like to think of Decred as it, people work with Decred, whereas people tend to work for Bitcoin. And that's where those two different approaches come from to the, uh, the sound money principle. So now I know you've taken some time out and um, have been working on DCR on-chain metrics. What have you come across? What have you studied? And what have you discovered when it comes to the data for DCR on-chain? 
Yeah, so I'm 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 personally fascinated by on-chain metrics. I think it's it's such an amazing field of science that I think is going to have a huge role in the future. I think more and more high-level analysts will be looking at this uh, as these protocols continue to gain traction. Um, until I started looking at Decred, I, I was fairly heavily into studying on-chain for for Bitcoin, and really Bitcoin has a very very organic on-chain signature. There's lots of fractals that we can draw out of it. And there's lots of very smart minds who are creating on-chain metrics faster than I can study them. So it's a great field to be in from a learning experience. Um, when I started looking at at Decred, one of the things, the, the first things I did as part of my fundamental checks was to just have a quick look and see how the the on-chain behavior uh, was, particularly around market cap, realized cap. Um, and what I'm actually most excited to look at is the ticket behavior because it's, it's a truly unique uh, value proposition. And what I found when I just did that first pass is that there was certainly a rhythm that I'd not seen, um, particularly between the realized cap and the market cap. Um, it really did flow in a very different way to what I'd seen elsewhere in the market. Um, you can look at things like Litecoin and, and Bitcoin Cash. And in general, their metrics are very, very noisy. Um, there's, there's lots of individual events with not much follow-up. With Bitcoin, you can actually see fractals play out very, very clearly. And with Decred, I was able to see an, a number of, of, of fractals that it at least told me that there was something more going on. So the first thing I looked at was um, my study on monetary premiums and really starting to understand what, once you take Plan B's model for Bitcoin, um, I, I don't think we have the data, the time, and the environment yet to be looking at altcoins in their individual data sets, in their isolated data sets, the way that Plan B looked at Bitcoin. Um, maybe for Litecoin, maybe for Dash, these coins that um, started up in 2014. Um, but I think that 2017, because there was so much um, in insane speculation looking for the next Bitcoin, I don't believe that the price and the market structure was necessarily organic. And I think you, you do need to give it enough time to uh, to really develop a, uh, a good value versus um, stock to flow type uh, type scenario. I don't think we can ever replicate Bitcoin. I think Bitcoin is its own thing. Uh, I, I don't think we should be looking to try and replicate it because the reality is it, it's a one-time event. It's like a, it's like a Banksy artwork, right? There's, it, it, it's one of these one-of-a-kind events that just can never be uh, recreated. So when I started looking at, uh, at, at Decred, what really excited me was looking at this ticket lockup and the, the, the smoothness of the realized cap and market cap made, made me think that the proof of stake had a very significant role to play. So the, as I looked into the, the monetary premiums, I was effectively looking at them compared to Bitcoin's center of gravity. So assuming that this thing is kind of carved out the center for um, people's understanding or, or appreciation of scarcity and value, because it was so organic, we may have kind of carved out a central path for human value of uh, in scarcity expressed through price versus that stock to flow metric, which is kind of happening in the background. And what was very interesting when you plot, I think it was um, Dash, Bitcoin Cash, um, Litecoin, Bitcoin, and Decred together, they all do tend to converge to that, that central line, that center of gravity. Um, but by far, Decred held onto that line um, with the highest monetary premium. It spent the most amount of time above that line, which indicates that even as the coins were issued into the market, and we have to bear in mind that Decred still has a very high inflation rate by comparison to, uh, to other projects in the market, even though it had that very high inflation rate, it was still gaining market cap at a rate that none of the other coins had, had done. And in fact, even outperformed Bitcoin in this sense in terms of retaining that monetary premium. So that really did get me thinking that the tickets and the the constant demand for for, um, for that ticket space is, is is very important. So really, the next phase of my my research is to be looking into that that value metric and understanding what the transaction flows, um, how the realized cap moves with the with the ticket demand, um, and even just looking at how the distribution of coins because it comes in through proof of work, proof of stake, and the and the treasury fund. How do those coins get distributed through the network and how many of them keep making their way back to ticket demand? And what's very interesting is that even though only 30% of the block reward is proof of stake, uh, we've just hit over 50% of coins locked in, in tickets. 
So there is there is clearly a demand there for ticket space that goes above and beyond and requires people to continue to invest. And it goes back to the the decred skin in the game um, fundamental basis of that that of the social contract. Hmm. So circling back to your digital organisms and um, human organization with these protocols, how do you see Decred revolutionizing these ideas and its incentive structure for decision making? Yeah, I, I think this is this is really interesting, and we're, we're seeing human organization in in this industry play out in in interesting ways. So as I said before, Bitcoin kind of is its own protocol and people people will acquire it of their own self-interest. Um, I know Ethereum is building a lot of DAOs and other systems to try and incentivize people to, to, to enter and make decisions and give their time, energy and money. And w- what's a fairly common theme in, in that model is it's all driven by donations. It's driven by people who are committing capital uh, for the greater good, in, uh, for, for want of a better term. I think that that works, uh, especially in the early phase where you've got people who obviously made a lot of money in the early days and um, are protecting their investment. So there is a skin in the game component there. But where I see Decred playing a very different role here is it designed incentives for people to make decisions and be responsible for those decisions from day one. And more importantly, it, it, it did it in a very, very transparent manner. And when you look at something like Politeia, Politeia is a, a really, really simple but very, very clever system where you have people who effectively you're signing and creating and negotiating contracts in the public sphere. And, you know, given my background in, in engineering and construction, um, I, I see a lot of tenders that come in and, and there's, there's lots of games that get played behind the door and I can only imagine that, that that's a, a sentiment that's uh, probably felt in almost every industry. But you never get an idea about exactly what the market's doing. A lot of it is guessing games. Uh, a lot of it is trying to understand what your competitors are doing with, with limited information. And then there's all sorts of games that go on uh, client side as well. And what I think Decred has done here is it's built a, a system for establishing negotiating contracts, whether it be between individual people, between companies, whatever the system is as well as a system of uh, delivering the work, so putting forward a proposal, delivering the work, and being paid upon completion. I think there's a very, very powerful system of organizing remote work here. I think it, it the incentives are aligned such that people must make decisions for the betterment of the system. And really, you're appeasing to a, a decentralized group of stakeholders, which, you know, there's, there's a common common thought that if you take an average of enough people, you're going to get pretty close to the truth. It's really the the concept that prediction markets are based on. And what we basically have here is a prediction market on value being proposed to value being delivered um, on every single system. And whether that be a protocol change or somebody putting in something to do some research, there's a balance that everybody makes uh, who has that skin in the game. Is that money worth spending in order to bring value to a my investment, there's that self-interest element, but also the collective intelligence, and I, I think that's that's really powerful. I think, it, to be honest, I think it's a very very clever way of building in that funding mechanism from day one, rather than relying on somebody donating and expecting that to be a long-term method. What Decred has done is effectively built it into the protocol itself to incentivize people to to work for the good of the system. And I think that's a, uh, that's a very, very interesting proposition. So now this narrative has been tossed around before, but how do you view crypto assets as a true declaration of independence from nation states? Yeah, this is, a, this is interesting. And there, there was a, a Medium article that uh, Black Bear put out recently that was very, very good at this and where he compared uh, Bitcoin to the Declaration of Independence in the US. And whilst I'm not familiar with American history, uh, my understanding that that's effectively the succession where they're saying, you know, um, to the uh, to the British, no, this is our this is our turf now, and we, we run ourselves. And Bitcoin is that first point where we say, okay, money is now here to be separated from state, and you know, it's that sly roundabout way that they can't stop. And I think that concept is really really important. So Bitcoin has effectively planted that flag and said, you know, money is here to be separated from state. Assuming the thing doesn't explode, it's more than likely that it's going to uh, have at least a very, very close impact 
and, uh, and, and, and push towards that objective. What it is going to do, though, is, is calcify in the uh, probably the medium term. And what's going to be very interesting there is that the, uh, the, the analogy is that the, that decred is a proposing the constitution. Right, rather than the Declaration of Independence, which is that initial stag and um, um, the initial flag in the ground, Decred is proposing something where it's taking those same core principles, but it's saying, "But we can adapt." And as the future changes around us, and as you know, the the world and the financial system and the the nature of a digital world, which is inherently going to be an exponential change, because we've seen that, you know, ever since the uh, the birth of the first computer chip we're going to see changes that need to be enacted. And the constitution itself has amendments because the world changes. Um, policies and laws and things change, but they don't necessarily need to change to a significant extent. Just needs to be just enough amendments that has got enough of those um, uh, signatures and buy-in and people who actually want to do the best by the system uh, behind it. And that's where I think Decred really plants that, that, that flag of saying, well, we can amend and we can change the protocol, still extremely difficult to change. You must gain that, that social contract consensus, but the mechanism is there. It is possible to do that, and in an uncertain future, I think that's, that's a very, very valuable proposition. So, Checkmate, now that you're a DCR contractor, um, I've seen a lot of people come into the community and have trouble with this process, but it seemed very easy for you, and... Um, just very lighthearted. The community was extremely receptive. What was that process like? And why do you think the community was so receptive? Yeah, I mean, it, the whole thing has been a very positive experience. Um, what, what I really, really enjoy about the Decred community is whenever you put out a question or a, a response or an idea, you will always get a thoughtful answer. And there's, there's not a great deal of, uh, of maximalism that floats around. A lot of it really is sensible discussions talking about what are the variables. Um, I think the, the, the core tenants are still there on, uh, on sound money. So there's still a, uh, an alignment there with Bitcoin. However, I think the, the community is willing to put in a lot, of, a lot of effort to really discuss at an individual level. And I think I, I found that, that really intriguing. And to be honest, I think it speaks a lot to the Decred social contract, which is about putting in that, that thought um, and, and consideration to things. Um, and I think that comes out in the the skin in the game narrative, right? If you if you really want to do want to work with the decred organism, um, you you basically find a niche that you think that you can fit in. And the reality is, you, you read a lot of, um, you know, Richard Red did a, did a fantastic paper on on Medium talking about his experience entering the DAE, and you, you read it and it, it it sounded exactly like me, right? I have no programming skills. Uh, one of those things I'm slowly working on, but um, it, it's you don't need to necessarily be able to be a protocol developer. Uh, you don't need to be even writing writing software. You can find any number of, of, of elements where you can add value. And I think the, the reality is if you come in and you, you put in the initial effort, um, do it because you're interested and you want to learn. I think if you come at things from a base of wanting to learn and, and educate yourself and you ask the questions, you will you will invariably find your interest levels peak, and once you get to that point of of where you feel you've got the confidence and the understanding, um, put forward a proposal. There's all sorts of things that you can do, and I think the it, it, as long as you come in with the expectation that you're you're putting forward a proposal to a a decentralized group of people who have significant money on the line and want to make the best decision for the long term. Uh, there's still a lot of value to be created. Uh, you know, this, we're at the start of the innings. So I think there's there's lots of niches and there's lots of elements of, of building a decentralized organization and really a decentralized organization in the terms of human human um, human organizations as well as a, an organism. So um, I think come in with an open mind, start by learning and asking questions, um, put your mind out there. The, Twitter's full of people who, who, who are lurking in the background and just observing what's going on. Um, never be afraid to get your ideas out there because you have no idea who's going to latch on. And there's, again, there's so many people out there that have the same question as you. Uh, and I think coming at it from a point of, uh, of knowledge sharing and, uh, and joining to that open source side of this, this whole industry is, uh, is really where it's at. 
So now that your research proposal has passed, uh, what are your plans and how do you feel you will create an impact with your work? Yeah, I mean, I, I really want to explore the on-chain side of things. I think uh, Decred needs a, a, a review on what, what, how the actual network is performing and um, understanding what's going on on the ledger is, is going to be a key part to that. At the same time as going through that process, I'm, I know there's going to be a lot of concepts and you know um, models about the incentive structure and how the coin distribution works and kind of those bite-sized chunks of information. And what I really want to do is distill that down into um, bite-sized pieces that people can can read, understand, and kind of dissect the Decred beast over time. Because you know people are going to be learning about uh, Bitcoin and Decred and uh, and any of these networks that survive for for many many years. You know, people who got into Bitcoin in the in the early days are still learning every single day. There's still so much out there to uh, to understand and, and grasp. And as these things change, it, it, I, I don't see any uh, sign of that slowing down. So I, I think what, what I really want to do is, is create information pieces that people can digest and understand and start building up their own fundamental model about not only what Decred's about, but what incentives and what consensus mechanism and what all these, these pieces that are important to work in tandem but also an entire topic of their own. So I, what I really want to do is string those together and, and, and really go for that knowledge and information sharing and uh, education side. So now, what are some of your long-term concerns when it comes to the project? What are some holes that you see that may need patching or that we could uh, attack over time? Yeah, that's, a, uh, that's an interesting question. And to be honest, I think, I think the thing that is probably the highest risk is the governance system at scale. So, you know, we've, we've seen governance. Yeah, oh, totally. Yeah. We've seen governance around the world. Uh, you know, to be honest, how many countries are we all running and they're all doing different experiments? None of us have really got governance right yet. So I think the, the, the scale and preventing apathy is going to be really important for the Decred governance system. So I, I would, I'm really excited to see how that plays out. I think it's important for it to play out because it, it, it's probably the soundest model of on-chain governance that we have. It's kind of the dichotomy to what Bitcoin has done. And I think it's going to be very, very interesting to see yet another experiment in, uh, in human governance and organization play out in the long run. So now we have some new features on the way. Uh, there's a Polisea proposal on the decks. We know privacy is lurking. Um, what are some of the things that have you optimistic about the project or that you're looking forward to? Oh wow! Um, yeah, I, I think I think both of those uh, are, are super important. Um, I really like the uh, the implementation of privacy. I think that's that's uh, an, an essential, that's essential. Step, isn't yeah. it? So I think once Definitely. you've got privacy, I, I think the the combination of privacy, atomic swaps, and the DEX are a extremely compelling feature set. And I think in a, in, a, in a world that's driven by data mining and you know a violation of people's privacy. I think to yet again put down another flag in the ground and say no, 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 we're going to take this back and and uh, live as free individuals. I think that's that's hugely important. And to be honest, if I'm going to go long view, uh, in terms of what I'm opti optimistic about, I'm really excited to see this this value stack play out over time. And if it does play out this way, I think that Decred is going to be an extremely powerful and an extremely wealthy um, organization in the future. And I think. The, the ability for it to uh, to employ a large swathe of people to do arguably whatever stakeholders vote in. Um, and if Decred ever gets big enough, th th there's no limit to, to what that might actually be. I think that's a, that's a really, really exciting. Even the concept of, of, of a protocol getting to that size and, uh, and being able to manage such an, a, an enormous amount of funds is, is going to be a really, really fascinating thing and really a world first. Yeah, I have to agree. Give me uh, the emotional state of your relation with Decred in one word. I know you were waiting for this one. Well, I, I respect. I have ah. so much respect for the design and how well equipped Decred is to deal with an uncertain future. That's that, I think that's that's the best word I can use to summarize. That's a good one, most definitely. All right, so now we're getting into the Decred bulletproof section. This is a series of questions that I ask all my guests when they come on. I'll be changing them over time, but I think it's great to get everyone's take 
on a certain set of questions. That way you get different answers from different people. So I'll start with the first check. If Decred was to fail, what would be the cause of its death? I think the biggest risk to Decred is probably Bitcoin's network effects. Um, and I think that if the biggest threat in my eyes is that Bitcoin becomes just so large and everybody who's ever thought of an altcoin is just completely wrong and it does just suck the air out of the room. I think if, if, if the true playing out of this, um, this distributed system and this experiment that we're all running really is that uncensorable and unchangeable sound money is all that blockchains are good for, I think that's probably the biggest risk to, to, to Decred is, is that network effect that just can't be, can't be beat. So now for the second one, um, some say it's good for it to be difficult to change consensus. Decred does nothing special other than draw focus to a specific activation method baked into the protocol layer, which can be ported into any other project. What are your thoughts on that statement? Yeah, I think, I think it's, it's, it's a bit shallow in that it keeps it only to the technical side. I think what that misses is, yes, there's an element there of, uh, you know, baking into the protocol and ability to change consensus, but it leaves out the incentive game. It leaves out the game theory. And, and that's really where Decred's differentiated itself to a, to a great extent. Um, you, you, you need to get the consensus from not only the miners, you know, 90%, 95%, and you need to get 70% of the, the stakeholders to, to, to approve things. Um, so not only are you trying to capture both of those arms, um, but you're competing with the social contract. So Decred is still very difficult to change. Um, what we have is a very, very good sound, um, a, a very sound social contract where everybody understands that, you know, the future is uncertain. We have the ability to adapt, but we also need to retain those core sound money principles. And I, I think, yeah, I think that statement, it leaves out the skin of the game element, which is so critical to, uh, to Decred's function. And uh, importantly, the balance of that 60, 30, 10 um, between the, the miners, stakers and the builders. So I think that it, it leaves out a lot of that uh, fine tuning. So now this attack is uh, directed at the pre-mine. So now Bitcoin launched without a pre-mine. All of their projects outside of Bitcoin are built around the financial interest of their creators. What are your thoughts? Um, I think that I think it applies to Bitcoin and Linux. Really, there's very few other systems where people will just freely work and and, and build something at, at, at you know with with no remuneration at some point. Um, part of the pre mine, you know, fifty percent of it went to bootstrapping the, the proof of stake um, and was given out free. The other fifty percent, a vast majority of it, um, to the to the developers still hasn't moved. And if you look at the pre mine that these early people in, in Bitcoin, you could argue exactly the same thing. Um, I think all companies and um, human endeavors have some need for profit at some point. There's very few people who can just build uh, build for free. Uh, I, I think the, the way that Decred has incentivized everybody to act uh, for the best interest of, of the system and themselves is, yeah, I, I think that the, the pre-mine is, is, is one thing. It's not a, it's not a crazy amount. Um, I think 8% is, um, is fairly reasonable, especially with the split. And uh, especially when you look at anything in, uh, w with its peers, I, I just think that you need some kind of mechanism to, to incentivize people to build. Right. You could also argue that the Satoshi team was the first to mine Bitcoin Correct. At, a low at a low cost. And at no competition. So, yeah, yeah. I, I think it's a moot point. All right, so let's go for the, the final one. I guess this takes a stab at our treasury. Uh, people will invest in things that make the world better, whether it be time or money, they will invest. You don't need a dev fund embedded into the protocol to incentivize development. This um this was taken when uh, when Square Crypto had announced that it was gonna invest into, uh, into Bitcoin. Mm. Yeah, it, it, it's interesting. And, and funding is a, I mean, it, it's a hot take right now. There's lots of projects who are struggling with funding. You've got projects that are designed purely on the donation side, which are struggling to, struggling to find the money to build. Um, you know, th this is where Bitcoin has that advantage of network effects and, yeah. uh, and Linux, you know, some companies yeah, because pay people. Lead. To, yeah, totally. It's got a great lead, yeah. Correct. And, and we, we can't argue that that's there. But I also don't think that that's something that we should ignore and, and say that, well, we can't innovate, right? Just because Bitcoin was first doesn't mean that there's no innovation potential uh, anywhere else. 
So I, I think having a system that is built in, transparent from day one, and same as the pre-mine here, um, the treasury and the pre-mine are both completely auditable and were understood ahead of time. Everybody knows these these things exist, and Decred does an excellent job of making all of that extremely visible. So I, I think that the rules for Decred have been set up from day one. We know that Zcash is having trouble because they're trying to rebuild that that funding mechanism, which is a challenge um, to do things in the rearview mirror. But what Decred has done a very good job of is pre-planning and making that very transparent and obvious from the start and, and saying this is exactly what the social contract is. And again, it's an opt-in system. So I, I think that the ability to incentivize builders and the ownership of that by the stakeholders is is hugely important. I agree. You're even seeing projects like EOS launch it down now as well. Yeah. So it's it's been... Um, Everybody needs to pay the bills. Yeah, absolutely. So, Chuck, I appreciate you coming on the show. This has been fantastic. What are your Good closing fun. thoughts? What are your closing thoughts and a message to newcomers and potential stakeholders for the community? Yeah, I, I think I think Decred is a master of capturing human mind share. And importantly, when people come into the vortex, they tend to stick around. Uh, what I found in the Decred community is that the people who are in in this space here have put the thought in. It comes with the skin in the game ethos. There's a lot of reasons, and and, and Bitcoin, I, I think I've said this a few times in the past, but Decred is the only other protocol that's taught me personally at a very deep level as much as Bitcoin has. You know, there's the saying, Bitcoin changes you more than you change it. Um, I think that still applies for, for Decred, but you can still have an impact, a very, very meaningful impact and I think the discussions that I see and, and have with people in, in this community is it's extremely insightful. And I, I think there's a huge, it speaks to not only the protocol, uh, but the people who are, who, who are coming by and, and, and sticking around. So I think Decred is built for the future. I think it's built to last. And I'm, uh, I'm personally very excited to, uh, to be on the ride. <laughs> no, we're happy to have you most definitely. Check. Where can people find you on the internet? Yeah, so uh, my handle on uh, on Twitter is Checkmatey, and you can find me uh, milling around in in, in Matrix and uh, Twitter is where I normally hang out. But uh, I've also uh, increasing number of uh, of papers going to be coming out on Medium, and um, feel free to catch me over at uh, at Ready Set Crypto, where I, uh, I I operate as a as a writer and uh, working with our community there. So that's uh, that's really where I got my start and have huge respect for those guys so check me out over there well check thank you for your time thank you very much been a pleasure